My first point concerns the point which is the real big problem among the Lacanians today, the real. Watch with this unfortunate notion of the real. My trauma here is what I cannot characterize in any other way than a great political and theoretical fiasco by Jacqueline Miller. If you want to know what I'm referring, referring to, you can find it easily on the web. His text on, I mean, the title is a very, already if you smell the title, you can see that something is wrong mm -hmm. with it. Something like uh, the real for the 21st century or something like this. Miller's idea is this one, that for the standard Lacan, okay, it's ridiculous to call it the early Lacan, when Lacan was already in his 60s, in the 1950s, but that for the standard Lacan, real was simply nature with its permanent natural laws. That's why Lacan refers to nature, sorry, to the real as that which always returns to its place like that on which we may even put it, on which we can rely to return to its proper place. Like, we count on the same stars reappearing uh, on the same place on the sky, sun, moon, seasons, all that bullshit. Nature is that relying circular movement. Then he claims, of course, later with modernity, nature was lost its, how should I call it, spiritual background of meaning. The traditional nature, of course, is spiritualized nature, in, in, not in the sense that there are necessarily gods or whatever, but spiritualized in the sense that natural phenomena are imbued with meaning, usually sexualized meaning. You know, all these uh, cosmologies of uh, uh, universe, um, coming to be through some copulation or whatever between masculine and feminine principle, yin, yang, whatever you want. And it's interesting to note how here Plato is much better than Aristotle. I'm saying this because usually it's popular to elevate this unfortunate tendency most liberals, even Lenin falls into this Aristotle as more progressive, absolutely not. If you know a little bit of Aristotelian ontology, you know that Aristotle re-sexualizes ontology. His couple of, uh, uh, of uh, basic ontological couple of form and stuff, morphe, hile, is explicitly sexualized. Main form, forming, creating the order out of the feminine chaos, feminine matter. So, again, uh, then Miller claims this, that the modern science, although it introduces mathematical order, I mean, it's no longer this spiritualized deeper meaning, I simplify Miller, but basically this is what he says, is nonetheless still, still a big other on which we can rely. Like, Newtonian natural laws, always the same, it's a big other, although, Miller knows this. The big revolution of modern science is the thick Aristotelian opposition between earth and sky, not in spiritual sense, but you know for the ancient Greeks on earth things were chaotic. But you look up in the sky, they're always the same in order. The big invention, invention, insight of Newton was, no, it's the same. Exactly the same laws on our earth and in the sky. But nonetheless, for Miller, it still remains an, a well-ordered universe. And then his big discovery with modern capitalism through its utter contingency asserted in capitalism, uh, we get a new type of the real. A real, as he puts it, outside the law a totally disordered real, a real which cannot any longer be symbolized, and following this line, Miller even uh, not renounces, but relativizes Lacan's earlier 
attempts of uh, for discourses of formal acts of sexuation as something which still belongs to the basically pre-modern order of meaning. For example, for Miller now, sex is something sexual libido rather is something totally chaotic outside the real and Miller even denounces Lacan's formulas of sexuation as nonetheless a clumsy attempt to symbolize this real. And then Miller basically it's a, all a very tragic breakdown, I claim, because he goes so far as to as to claim that that the basic it's basically a very vulgar capitalist ideology elevated into a Lacanian insight. It's that today everything is becoming contingent, you can change sex, everything is plastic and so on. On the market everything is crazy, dynamic, there are no laws and so on and so on. So psychoanalysis should teach us how to confront this, how to cope with this. I, I, for reasons which are very precise, allow me to briefly present them, I'm totally opposed to this vision. My first reaction is, my God, did this guy ever read Lacan, Miller? Because if there is something really pertinent in Lacan, is that he doesn't substantialize the real into an something external, impenetrable, you know, all this pseudo-postmodern poetics of the real as a traumatic outside that we cannot ever symbolize, we try, fail again and again to symbolize it. No, for, uh, for Lacan, the real is, in a way, absolutely immanent to the process of symbolization. It's its immanent obstacle, as it were. It's something in the very structure of the symbolic order which makes it fail. It's its internal antagonism, gap, negativity, however you call it. So, uh, you see my point. It's not an external obstacle. It's a totally... This is why Lacan is emphatic about how the idea of any equation between real and the Kantian, Kant, Immanuel Kant, think in itself, is totally wrong. The real is not out there impenetrable and we try to penetrate it but always fail and all this pseudo Nietzschean metaphoric also. You know that, that uh, the real is like looking directly into the sun, too strong, it blinds us, we cannot, and so on and so on. No, the, the greatness of Lacan, again, is total immanence of the real to the symbolic. Which doesn't mean that symbolic is everything, that's another question, I will address it later. But uh, uh, <coughs> Lacan's idea, if I get it correctly, is that the real in itself, if you want, is nothing but, as he, Lacan, puts it in his Seminar 20, uh, in Ampas de la Forma, a deadlock of formalization, the necessary short circuit inconsistency of normalization. And the temptation to be resisted is precisely to project the cause of this inconsistency into into an external realm, as if in itself symbolic order is consistent, but it is disturbed from the outside through traumatic impacts of the real and so on and so on. Let me go back to Freud. Just look at his best known example of a traumatic real, Wolfman, you know, the guy seeing his parents coitus at ergo. But read Freud carefully. Freud is not saying this was a trauma, something that the small guy Wolfman was not able to symbolize and so on. No, Freud says almost the exact opposite. He says that the small kid, okay, maybe, we are not sure, one year and a half old, saw probably 
mother and father copulating at ergo. And then, as Freud emphasizes, at that point, he didn't know what to do with it. There was no trauma. He just stored this as an empty memory. It's years later, around four or five years, when the small Hans boy uh, began to, uh, no, it's not Hans, sorry, uh, it's uh, that uh, Russian guy, uh, began to, to, to be disturbed by sexuality, where do children come, all that stuff, that he resuscitated that experience. The experience was, as it were, re-traumatized. What was officially just, okay, fuck it, I don't know what they are doing there, moving like idiots and so on. And I think this is the most healthy attitude towards sex. Imagine not being aroused and observing two adults making love. Admit it, if you are honest, there is something extremely stupid about it. <laughs> <laughs> What's the point of it? <laughs> more and more, I'm, what? You don't believe in it. My favorite British joke, if you ask me, <laughs> is that a, a lord is doing on the park of his palace, how do you call this in push-ups, you know? It's and good. Butler comes to him, you must know the joke, and tells him, <laughs> did his lordship not notice that the lady has already left, you know, and so on. I mean, that's the truth of it. But okay, that's another story. What I want to say is this, that you see the point that uh, uh, the, the real deadlock is not, oh my God, the trauma, what my parents were doing, and so on. The real deadlock is the imminent deadlock of sexuality. Symbolic deadlock. What does it mean, inconsistent, and so on. And the real comes second. I, what I like to use here as a rather rough metaphor would have been anti-Semitism or other forms of racism. It's precisely the anti-Semitic vision that, you know, we have a harmonious social order, a Jew comes from outside, disturbs this order. Or, indifferent for us in Western Europe now, up to a point we can say there are refugees from the Middle East, whatever you want. My point is that you see the paradox, the obstacle, the inconsistency comes first. The Jew, the figure of the Jew is just an attempt to fill in an, or to even to renormalize, I would have said, an inconsistency which is imminent. And that's how, haha, I will answer one of your questions, I'm not so bad as you think. Uh, just forget about this for discourses, I hate them so much. Do you have this here? Is that it? Yes. Is it? Yeah. yeah, I can use it. You remember, you asked me what does it mean in the... This is the lower part, the formulas of... Like on, this is the male side as relates to woman as this is very simple to read. This simply means that the male subject relates mostly, it's more open to woman reducing her to the object cause of her desire. Which, when Lacan says this, we should read into this all the violence implied. You know, that famous subtitle of Lacan, somewhere in Seminar 11, where he says, I love you, but because I love in you something more mm -hmm. than you, I will destroy Story. you, and so on and so on. I mean, there is even a movie on this. I mean, this would be Vertigo. Scott, he loves in Madeleine something more than Madeleine, and so, but, uh, okay. Then you have L.A. La, the woman who doesn't exist, and she is split between signifier of the Bart other, signifier of the inconsistency of the other, and the capitalized phi. Now, what's the main point I want to make here? Uh, that uh, this, again, this aspect is relatively simple for Lacan. Maybe he simplifies it, it's more complex, but basically, the way I read it is that in a typical uh, masculine sexuality, when man relates to a woman, basically it has immanently the structure of a masturbation with a real partner. 
What do I mean by this? We know the common sense definition of masturbation. You do it to yourself, but you just imagine some fantasy, whatever you dream about it. Lacan turns this around implicitly, and his claim is that, but real sex, from the male standpoint, is nothing but masturbation with a real partner. That is to say, even if you do it with a real partner, you use the real partner just as a prop to actualize, to fantasize in body, in body, in a body, as it were. Now, I will not go into it too much, because it's Lacan's position is not that every sex is that, and so on. But, okay, uh, what, I, uh, uh, what I want to go is to this uh, much more intriguing aspect of how the non-existing woman, this division of the woman between capitalized phi, which is usually read as the phallic function and signifier of the inconsistency of the other. Here I want to elaborate things a little bit. I think it is totally wrong to read this as a sign of a, the sign of a division of woman. Even Lacan's seminar encore, where he speaks about jouissance feminine, is often read in this way, as if woman is partially caught into the symbolic order, but partially she escapes it. And then, of course, this part of woman, which is not caught into the phallic symbolic order, then can be given either a positive or a negative spin, of course. You can be a masculine sexist and claim, yeah, yeah, women are not fully civilized, fully within culture. Women are just partially civilized, they just, you have this wonderful paranoiac theories, my favorite one, it's horror, but you should read it if you want to get horrified. Now there is a new translation in the United States, I think, Otto Weiniger, Sex and Character, the ultimate anti-Semite, anti feminist. Uh, there is even a rumor that Hitler said that this is the only Jew that he would not, that shouldn't be killed. Because he was a Jew, he wrote his book when he was 23, Sex and Character, Brutal Anti-Feminism and Semitism, and at the end, since he was a Jew, he killed himself. I mean, no, it was an authentic, tragic position. He draw the conclusion that the best solution for humanity is collective suicide, with which I tend to agree. My favorite movie is Love von Trier, Melancholia, but that's another question. So uh, what I'm saying is that uh, this false reading, I hope to prove, of uh, sexual, of jouissance uh, feminine as the woman is not wholly within the symbolic order, you find a very brutal, although nicely elaborated version in Weininger, where he gives such a brutal example. It's vulgar, but it's so nicely elaborated. He says that a woman simply doesn't, cannot relate to truth. No, she knows is she lying or not, but she is not able to pursue truth for the sake of itself. She said a woman can choose to tell the truth, but it will be always motivated by some hidden pathological, usually sexual interest, you know. Like, I don't know, can I be vulgar? Sorry, you are not my child. I ask you, will it be raining tomorrow? Well, you know what Weininger would have said? That you would first have thought, what does he want for me? Is this a proposal to take me out tomorrow? Do I want this guy to be, go on a date on him? And then, you know, your answer will be always conditioned by this. You are, sorry to inform you about this, you are not able to directly... This disgusting theory, but you know why I'm telling it to you? Ah, ah, I'm tricky here. Not to... Okay. Many people will accuse me that my, my entire perverted pleasure is under the excuse of a, a, attacking anti-Semitism to enjoy telling you this dirty anti-feminist stuff. No, no, it's more complex, because I want to spoil your enjoyment much more. You know what's the true shock of Weininger? 
You cannot imagine modern art without him. And by, when I say modern art, I mean top modern art. I mean, for example, Kafka. It's clear from his letters, dialogue. For Kafka, if you look at feminine figures in, in Kafka, Kafka's novels, all those teacher and, how do you call it, uh, uh, waitresses in, in the inns, in castle, in, uh, in uh, the, uh, the trial, they are, uh, they are figures, they are Weidinger figures. Then, Arnold Schoenberg, and you know this, these are Jewish guys, Arnold Schoenberg, then Edward Munch, Strindberg, name them, absolutely crucial for early modernity, at least. Up to, I'm always, I think I was too good to watch him. I, I think I already mentioned this. Did you see Tarkovsky's, especially Solaris? I think it's a deeply Weiningerian film. It's a man who is haunted by the presence of his dead wife and the whole trajectory of the film is how to get rid of this dream to establish a relationship with his father. And uh, he literally almost quotes or enacts Weininger's thesis that a woman doesn't exist, a woman is just a hallucination of men. A woman, and Weininger paradoxically even draws from this a kind of a democratic, not feminist, but open conclusion. He says it's meaningless to fight women because they don't exist. Women just materialize the ethical failure of men. What really only exists is man fighting for his ethical sense. And if you fail, you embody your failure in a woman. So, the idea is you look you get rid of this hold of a woman upon you, woman ontologically disappears. So, uh, uh, again, my point now is that this reading, of course, has to be totally rejected. This reading of woman as whatever then you, in whatever way you formulate this excess, some primordial, natural, evil, cunningness, calculation, whatever, not fully in the symbolic order, in the sense of, and Weininger is here Kantian, he claims a woman, he can be very vulgar here, cannot understand categorical imperative. A woman is constitutively unable to do an ethical act in the sense of just for the sake of duty. There always has to be some uh, calculation and so on. Uh, uh, uh. <coughs> so, again, not only we have absolutely to reject this, this version of the substantialization of woman as if we have the symbolic order and men can fully enter it in the sense of their entire jouissance is fallicized, which means subjected to symbolic castration, and then women who are just partially in it. Because you know what is even more dangerous is the opposite aspect, where you in a false way, and I find this in a way even more disgusting than this outright anti-feminist attitude, where you read that excess which in a woman resists symbolization as something great positive, in the sense of we men are fully into symbolic and we, that's why we lose our true vitality. While in a woman, some part resists symbolization, some part is still connected to some earthly substantial vitality and so on. They even, along these lines, read a phallic enjoyment as a pseudo-castrated enjoyment. We men can enjoy only in a castrated form. The way, work of enjoyment survives symbolization, which al always has a castrating effect, in the sense that it's already within the symbolic order where the original object of desire is lost, whatever you want, while women still have contact with that pre-symbolic, authentic jouissance feminine. So, my first thesis would have been, it doesn't matter what do you choose. This very paradigm of 
Man is fully within the symbolic order, while woman is only partially in it, there is a part in her that resists, is absolutely to be abandoned. So, but nonetheless, you will say now, but nonetheless, there is a division here. Oh, the first thing to note is that this signifier of the Bart other, which is on the feminine side, did you notice that it's not nothing real in the naive sense of outside the symbolic order in it. It's a signifier. It's just signifier of the inconsistency of the symbolic order. And now comes my big thesis. Big, okay. That this is not to be read as a division in the sense of here is one enjoyment, here is another enjoyment. No, it's just a distinction in stance. It's the same enjoyment just from a different perspective. What do I mean by this? What do I mean by a signifier of the inconsistency of the big other? There are old examples that I use all the time, so I will be very short. Think about Spinoza, his definition of God, not Deus Sive Natura, but this personalized God. He says very nicely that although God, as Father up there, personalized God, appears as a, the highest being, a fascinating greatness, it's just a name for our ignorance. Like yes? We lost, we lost your sound. Really? At the crucial time. Yeah. My God, this is a wonderful effect. I hope you would start to laugh. You know, it's the same as I always like this. You remember on TV, if you watch opera and then the sound goes off, it's the same as what I was describing as sex done by a British lord, you know. All of a sudden you see the stupidity of, <laughs> of gestures and so on. Okay, thanks. I hope now it works. What I wanted to say is that all that happens the this it's not simply phallic function Lacan oscillates here this capitalized phi is phallus but phallus in its fascinating dimension also Who's Spinoza sorry You're telling us something about Spinoza yeah but I'm coming okay, to that uh -huh. uh, uh, Spinoza says that what appears to us as the signifier of the highest the most noble thing like God is a false positive term is just is just imposing a false positive form on on a gap a negativity and the thing to do is just to render this negativity inconsistency visible let me give you another example that i've used 20 30 times not more uh, precisely uh, uh, Okay, I'm, I'm ashamed to mention it, but okay, it works. You know Steven Spielberg, Joss, Shark. Yeah. When yes. I was young, uh, there were debates. What does the shark, which is slaughtering, uh, attacking people in the uh, seaside resort, what does it stand for? And there were right-wing theories or leftists reading it in a right-wing way, claiming that, oh, it's clear, shark stands for the fear of ordinary Americans, of nature, of immigrants, and so on, all the external threats. Then there was our beloved Haha Fidel Castro, who I remember loved the movie. He said, no, it's clear. I don't know how it was clear to him. He said, no, it's clear that the shark stands for the exploitative big capital. And it is a deeply <laughs> anti-capitalist film and so on. <laughs> so what does the shark truly stand for? I claim it's the wrong question. It stands for everything and nothing. It's pure ideological operation. In what sense? Ordinary Americans, I give a very simplified reading, have many inconsistent fears. You fear immigrants, you fear global warming nature, you fear big capital banks, whatever, moral degradation. And it's an ingenious operation to exchange all these fears for one big fear, the shark. The shark is all of that. The shark has nothing to do with the shark. It's just one fascinating image which re uh, re retains your consistency. And why am I saying this? As I developed already 20, 30 times, it's exactly the same in classic anti-Semitism. 
Now, my theory here, I don't want to go into it. Uh, I'm here, uh, apropos anti-Semitism, my position is much more elaborated. Because on the one hand, I claim anti-Semitism really exists today. On the other hand, and I was nicely surprised how they were ready to swallow this in Tel Aviv when I gave a talk there. On the other hand, I claim Zionism, the way it functions today, is the latest form of anti-Semitism. But not here. Okay. We're not developing. What I wanted to say is that how does the figure of the Jew function? The first in classic anti-Semitism. The first thing you note immediately is that it's the same as with Shark. It's absolutely inconsistent. The Jew is at the same time calculating, you know, Jews are supposing just to count money all the time and so on, and, and, uh, and sleazy, Jews are obsessed with sex, they want to, so too intellectual and sleazy, they are, they work too hard, this is a classical anti-Semitic cliche about Jews, we ordinary Americans, British men, we have some fun, Jews, they just work all the night, no wonder they beat us at exams and so on, over intellectual, hard working and lazy. They don't wash, they smell bad and so on and so on. So what, uh, did you see the parallel that I wanted to draw? You have a series of, if you are a normal petit bourgeois, a series of inconsistent fears. You are afraid of being screwed up by big capital, exploited, losing your job. You are afraid of uh, immigrants uh, as a threat of nature, whatever. But the ingenuity of anti-Semitism is that all this inconsistent multiplicity of fears is replaced by one, by the fascinating presence of the Jew. And that's why I claim Jewish plot is plot, a plot in the wonderful double meaning of the term. Plot like narrative and plot like Jewish plot. Jewish plot is Hitler's narrative which, you know, let's, a very simplified version, Germans were confused in mid-late 20s, everything is wrong, I lost my money in the bank, lost my job, uh, 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 poor people, annoying my daughter, whatever, eh, Hitler offers a wonderful, okay, not so wonderful, narrative. It's the Jewish plot. You regain a consistent narrative. So, uh, uh, and this also is the point, now comes my big point, more theoretical. Uh, Jew, in this sense, is one of the great examples of what Lacan calls master signifier. And he says something very precise here. He says that master signifier is the point where signifier falls into the signified. Now, what does this mean? Ah, I claim... I will give you another example. I claim it's the point where signifier has to intervene into the signified content to even constitute its consistency. Let me give you another example which I used 20 times, not 30, 40. My favorite anti-communist joke from Poland. You must know this, I repeated here this couple of times, that this wonderful joke, uh, sorry, this idea of <coughs> Communism was that communism is the socialism, the way they built it in Poland, Soviet Union, is the synthesis bringing together all the most noble features of entire history of the world. It's the synthesis of the highest achievements, no? And, okay, the joke, of course, ironically refers to this, and it goes like this. Our socialism is the th synthesis of all the previous stages of human development. From early pre-state societies, it took primitivism. From ancient Greece and Rome, it took slavery. From uh, uh, feudalism, it took brutal domination. From capitalism, it took exploitation. And you got it, that's the beauty. From socialism, it took the name. You see, that's the crucial. To get it together, you have to add the name. In, it's the performative moment, if you want. So, what I'm trying to say is, so, you see, let's return to the Jew. Uh, you see, uh, and incidentally, we live in such decadent times, one of the saddest points of how, in our times, irony, even if it's brutal sarcasm, 
cannot be tolerated. It happened to my Jewish good friend, Udi Aloni. I was with him in some city, German city, where he was staging a theater performance. And uh, the German assistants were very inefficient, you know. They were bringing props on the stage, everything went wrong. And then Udi said something, he forgot that he is not with me, because I talk with him all the time like that. He started to shout at the Germans, where is your German efficiency? If during World War II you were to work in a clumsy way like that, you wouldn't even be able to carry through the Holocaust, and so on, you know. Everybody went to pain, and so on, and so on. It was too much for them, this joke. But I think because they were guilty, not because they were so shocked. That's another story. So let's go on. I hope you got what I was aiming at here. Imagine the Jew as long as you are within anti-Semitism. It's the fascinating presence, the Jew or the shark, this mega fascinating signifier. No? And then all you have to do is to see in it signifier of the inconsistency of the other. That it's, ah, to give you another, and I wonder if you, David, would agree or not, uh, because you are also, there are three super egos, the two ladies and you today with me, <laughs> for whom I'm afraid. sorry, ignore me totally, that's the nicer thing. Uh, because wouldn't you agree, I think that Marx also has a signifier of this inconsistency, at least if we accept the critical reading of it. I don't know enough to say is it true or not, but all I can say is, according to some historians, Marx's notion of Asiatic mode of production is a false notion. In what sense? Marx's original scheme was the usual one. Primitive tribal, pre-class societies, slavery, feudalism, capitalism, and whatever shit will come afterwards, communism or whatever. Then the idea is this one. Marx noted that there are modes of production in ancient China, in uh, ancient uh, South America, and so on, which do not fit any of these categories. And you see my point. The critique of Marx here is that Asiatic mode of production is a pseudo notion. It appears to be a positive notion. For, but its actual conceptual meaning is just all those modes of production which do not fit any of my categories. You see my point? That it's the, si the signifier of the inconsistency of Marxist categorization of the modes of production. It, it holds the place within this categorization of all that does not fit into it. It's, if I may be a little bit ironic, it's like that LGBT plus. This is the plus, no? And uh, it's not that I'm making fun of it. Rather, the theory, but I will not go into it now, the theory of, of, uh, of uh, uh, structural linguistics, semiotics, and so on, is that every system of meaning needs such a pseudo-element, an element which is a stand-in for what is excluded. And again, Lacan's name for this is master signifier. And the whole point is to see in the master signifier, which appears to be the highest point, oh, the it, God, whatever, the signifier of the inconsistency of the other. And that's crucial how we read it, because what we, what some Marxists call, and they are right calling it, class struggle essentialism. They read class struggle like this, the ultimate meaning, you know, the secret meaning, the ultimate meaning of all phenomena in our history is class struggle as the ultimate guarantee of meaning. Like, you want to learn what a certain phenomenon really means, look at its role in class struggle, and so on and so on. But I think there is a much more refined meaning of it. And Marx himself was on the trace of this other meaning. For example, 
if not nowhere else in his absolutely magnificent readings of the 48 revolution, class struggle in France, 18th premier of Louis Bonaparte and others, where class struggle is not the ultimate meaning. Whatever you do ultimately it means you support this or that class, but it's rather an operator of inconsistency of all others. For example, you have ecological struggle, it gets inconsistent. Why? Because it distorted through class struggle. Class struggle doesn't exist in itself. It's just the operator of inconsistency. Or, for example, you have a king or the highest figure in political order. As we say in Marxism, its unifying role masks a certain antagonism. So, again, going back to your question, I think that this is how we should read femininity. And also, mm -hmm. ah, now I will tell you another thing. I will nonetheless uh, return to one moment, uh, for one moment, for a brief moment, I will, I will succumb to your terror and say something about four discourses. Mm -hmm. This is the signifier produced here in analyst discourse, you know, S1. Even I was often misreading it. What does Lacan think about that in the discourse of the analyst, a master signifier is produced? Some people even read this as if Lacan is claiming, nonetheless, at the end of analytic discourse, a new master emerges, whatever. No, I think the master signifier is precisely the right word which makes you aware of this. You know, it's, for example, if you analyze Anti, if you analyze anti-Semitism, let's take this as anti-Semitism. I am a split anti-Semitic subject. I am confronting the psychoanalyst. And I, he is the one supposed to know. But what, through the work of transference, anal the analyst wants to bring me to is to produce that signifier. To become aware so S1 is not again a new master name. It's simply to produce a sign which ruins anti-Semitism for me, to put it in a very simplified way, because I have to accept that a Jew is just a mask for the inconsistency of the symbolic order and so on and so on. And it's another point which is crucial here. Uh, uh, what I mentioned before, you know, this is the difference between Freud and Jung. For Freud, following Lacan, the unconscious is not... Freud following Lacan? Yes. No, no, I didn't make a mistake. Although, of course, you know what I did now? I followed Helmut von Kleist. You know, he wrote that wonderful text where he says that all big inventions, I'm not saying this is a big invention, what I did, uh, in rhetoric and so on, emerge so that you say something stupid and then you try quickly to pack things up to make sense of your mistake. So, okay, in what sense Freud followed Lacan? But I admit it in advance, I'm just trying to squeeze out. Uh, in the same way as, ah, I will give you another example. Uh, in my reading of Haiti revolution, and we are in your territory here, the same people attacked you and me for silent uh, racism, claiming but still for us the model is French Revolution and all those third world guys can't do but copy the copy, you know, the white man has to do the first gesture. I think in a way which is not totally crazy, the temporality runs here the other way around in some sense, which is far from just metaphoric. Uh, French Revolution was a pale copy of the Haiti Revolution, which was the real thing. That is to say, to put it in Hegelian terms, only through its repetition in Haiti did French Revolution become fully what it was, a world historical event. So, uh, I will put it like this. Yes, French Revolution was the first.
but it only becomes the first to reach repetition. You know what I'm saying here? You will say I'm dreaming. If I'm dreaming, then Marx is dreaming. You remember one of the most beautiful statements of Marx? The anatomy of man is key to the anatomy of the ape. Which means the anatomy of Haiti revolution is the key to the anatomy of uh, French revolution. I'm sorry, it was, uh, Jacqueline, it was a desperate attempt to claim how Lacan is the key to Freud to squeeze <laughs> out of my stupid <laughs> sleep. Please. Okay, no, love it, that's fine. But, but, but yeah. You read that was a battle, and it's about your four discourses. Yeah. I don't read the A as the analyst. I read it as the object of here, which is to say as the object of fantasy. Yeah. And I see the analytic discourse as the object of here in relation or non-relation with the subject who is barred. Yeah. And that propels the dominant signifier and the chain of language beneath the bar of impression. And that's why it's only a quarter turn from the hysteric. Because the his and therefore the hysteric and the discourse of the analyst are so intimately connected. And because the hysteric starts from the position of the subject who is barred through, or to put it in yeah. Freudian terms, the, or no, this is not the right term, yeah. the, 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 the membrane between the conscious and the unconscious and the hysteric is stretched so thin that you can almost see straight through it to the unconscious. Now this is where I want to come back. Yeah to what you're saying about the two positions, your two critiques of the idea that women are not quite in yeah. the symbolic in the same way as men. Because I have more time for that than you, but I have time for it in this sense, not some rarefication yeah, yeah. of women's place outside yeah. the civilization, or her substantial being in a primordial nature. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. But the woman is related to the position of the hysteric and therefore quarter term in the discourse of the animals is surely, and you may want to agree, Lacan's way of saying she is situated differently in relationship to family knowledge. And for me, that gives her an advantage. Yeah. No, I, uh, sorry, I, usually I'm in a paranoia with you. I, <laughs> I expected a bigger, I expected you to be closer to our beloved Norman Bates, but you were a kind Norman Bates today. No, sorry, I totally agree. You know with what I especially agree? This crucial link between hysteria and analysis in the sense that uh, if there is one good thing about uh, Freud and Lacan is that they are far from this depreciation of hysteria, which was unfortunately, even I am unfortunately old enough to remember, one of the key uh, elements even of the 68 discourse, at least the way student revolution it popularly functioned. The idea was this one. Uh, hysterics are women who just provoke the master, they don't want to go to the end, they oscillate, like, but a pervert is the true one, he goes to the end. Or even the formula was popular, what hysterics only dream about, perverts go to the end, they realize it. I think it's absolutely here to return to what was clear to Freud already, where he says, although apparently a uh, sorry, pervert subject, you know, like, openly, you do whatever, but Freud says something very interesting. He says that nowhere is the unconscious more subtracted, more enclosed, more out of reach than in perversion. And authentic psycho, and even, I think this has to be linked to something which Lacan emphasizes when he says that every power every structure of political power authority needs a pervert as its obscene shadow to sustain it. So it's not, perversion is not subversive in this sense. Every strong power, the strongest it is, the more it needs a pervert. And again, against this, we should absolutely celebrate hysteria. And I totally agree with you, the only way where I don't even see where is a misunderstanding. Namely, I, you say this is not an analyst. Maybe not as a person, but isn't, okay, I put it like this, you know this better than me. 
probably. So I'm addressing the others. Lacan changed his position with this one because throughout the 50s, for him, the analyst was the big other, simply stood for the big other. And it was, I think that it's not psychoanalyst, it's just the role psychoanalyst has to play as this impenetrable object annoying you, uh, annoying, how does he become analyst or she uh, object uh, small a? On account, of course, of the supposed knowledge, which is always hidden and so on and so on. So I would just claim that uh, I agree with you, the hysterical subject is here, but uh, the uh, the an what is the, his the analyst? The analyst is of course not the master signifier. It's also not knowledge. Knowledge is the traditional normative analyst who knows better than you and tells you, you know. It's just this enigmatic point which forces you, and that's the beautiful thing, that the work is done here. Okay, Miller in one of his better bad taste jokes pointed this out when he says that psychoanalysis is, is, is even better than capitalism. In capitalism, the worker works, but it's paid a little bit. In psychoanalysis, you, the patient, have to work and you have to pay for it. You know, it's kind of an <laughs> ultra cap. Sorry, yes? Can you just explain how this notation works? Okay, okay. I tried to avoid this, but okay. Can I just uh, finish one point? Uh, literally two minutes, don't be afraid. Before I go on, just one point, what I said there about the real, you know where already Miller is wrong. He should have read Lacan, who knows it. <coughs> Ancient Aztecs and Incas, all that, they were not as stupid as they may appear. You know what's so crucial? This is the big enigma of their sacred rituals. Why do they sacrifice people? or whomever, slaves, whatever, you know, human sacrifices. That's the mystery, not what you would have expected to. It's not the usual thing. We go hunting, uh, we sacrifice things so that we will ha have luck in hunting, or we don't get enough rain, etc. No, the miracle is that they were sacrificing so that the most ordinary expected thing would happen. They were afraid that if they don't sacrifice, uh, next day the sun will not rise, and so on and so on. I found this an absolutely crucial insight. In a way, they already knew that natural order is, what we misperceive as natural order is sustained through a symbolic ritual. They were not stupid. Already their real was not this simple, stupid, uh, natural Real. Then, just the final point, the regular term, uh, about uh, uh, this postmodern, whatever today, real. Uh, Miller should have known it that uh, this lip, what appears as what we are witnessing today is, let's call it, denaturalized nature. But where do we encounter it? I think that the true horror of modern science horror for the traditional view where we have a clear distinction, nature, culture, and so on, is not everything is becoming culture, but that even nature is no longer nature as it should be. For example, uh, under the, because of the industrial effects of science, I think that what we are getting today is this Freaks of nature, you know, I was always afraid, I remember as a child there was a report in our newspaper, you know, sometimes it happens, this horror, a cow with two heads and three legs is born and so on, but that's what we are doing today, this freakish nature, and that's like, uh, uh, so, it's not, what is happening today is not some nature outside, outside, no, it's simply, nature affected by technology, which means there is no nature. That's how I would have resolved what, uh, what uh, Aaron was saying yesterday when I tried to squeeze him about that nature, not nature culture, like uh, transcendental horizon or realism and so on. He said something very nice, that on the one hand, for nature there is no culture. 
You know, for nature, it's, it's even meaningful to talk about like that. For nature, everything is nature. The difference nature culture is not immanent to nature. As far as we can talk like that, it's too naive, I know. But for culture, the moment we are in culture, then uh, every notion of nature is culturally mediated. No matter however you try to get at pure nature, it's culturally mediated. So, but when I tried to catch him, is I, and I still have that problem, and I discovered this is a problem for, for Heidegger even, for everyone. How to make philosophical sense, uh, now I'll say something horribly naive, but I want it, of the simple fact that somehow we all assume that we are all humanity, part of nature, that we developed out of nature. Is it? Because even today, philosophers of science, even who are full naturalists, they still made an exemption, a transcendental exemption. They claim that, yes, we are part of nature, but to scientifically explore it, that's Habermasian position, you have to presuppose the discursive logic of rational scientific argumentation and so on, which is always already here, and you cannot deduce it out of nature. Now, what's the position here? What I'm desperately trying to do is not to return to any Friedrich Engels style of dialectics of nature and so on, but to uh, elaborate a much more refined model where, of course, where like uh, uh, the transcendental, this idea of, you know, whatever we do, always already we are within a certain discursive or hermeneutic horizon of meaning, we can step over it without falling back into a naive realism. And I think for me, modestly, this is the big philosophical problem today, and I will not bore you with it now, but I already sent to medicine today, I will be here for three days in end of October, beginning of November, and I will talk precisely on that, psychoanalysis and philosophy and this problem. Okay, now, uh, my God, okay, let's do it, okay, <laughs> let's do it, but you know, it's like... I hate you. Yeah. When we communists take over, try to prepare your dossier for Kulak, you know, like <laughs> well, your confession, how. I can suggest the beginning, like already when I was a small boy, my parents educated me to hate the working class, begin with that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, let's do it. I will nonetheless do it. Uh, the first thing is with Lacan, that there are so many problems here, but the first one is that you never should forget that the whole scheme here is simply an articulation of Lacan's formula of uh, signifier. Signifier represents subject for other... Uh, Lacan oscillates here, we don't have time to interpret it. For other signifiers, another signifier, you have all the variations. So it simply, subject is represented by a signifier for other signifiers, but this operation never works out, there is a remainder, and this remainder is object small a. Object small a is that part of meaning which escapes uh, uh, meaning and so on and so on. And uh, that's why it's very important. On the lower level, we have here practically the formula of fantasy which I read in a very simple way. I say something, of course, my statement intervenes in the symbolic field, but it's forever, imagine this lower level as an enigma of, but why did I say this? What was the meaning? What was behind? And I claim fantasy for Lacan answers precisely is an answer to this abyss behind every meaning. Like, you said this, but what did you mean by this? Why? Why? And fantasy answers this. Like, in, even in social life, we have a hierarchic order, things are enigmatic. Ah, a good racist has an answer. 
It's enigmatic because behind the visible hierarchic order there is the Jew, the Jewish conspiracy or whatever. So this is the basic form. Forget about function of the master. This is simply the signifier that represents you within the symbolic field. Symbolic representation, again, ultimately always fails, and it's precisely that gap. We can even put it like this, that the uh, signifier of, uh, of the lack of the other is here. And here, to fill in this gap, but, you know, because again, as Lacan points out, behind, in human communication, behind every meaning there is always this question. But why did you say it? But why? And it's, you cannot get at the end of it. My favorite example here, it's a very stupid one, it's, uh, because I like it. I don't know how it is here, but from what I heard, Susan, you can correct me, in American academia, let's say I give a talk, and I ask you, how was my talk? You think it was shit, but you are too polite to say it openly. I was told that the way to say it, that the standardized form is to say it was interesting. It was interesting means to say it was shit in a polite way. <laughs> but what's the enigma here? The enigma is that now if you are a naive humanist, you will say, why not be open and say it was shit? Ah, the meaning would already have been different. If you tell me it was shit, I would have the full right to be shocked. Because the statement it was shit implies much more. It's not just a qualification of my talk, but it's absolutely an additional personalized, personalized uh, aggressivity. So, if you tell me it was shit, I would have full right to tell you. But if you really meant just that it was shit, why didn't you then tell me that it was interesting? I would have full right to say. <laughs> and you see Lacan's idea, fantasy enters here to fill in the gap in symbolic interaction, this enigma. You are saying this, but why are you saying this? And so on and so on. That's the fundamental form. Lacan calls these four places agent, truth. The truth, I think, also can be called the position of enunciation, from which agent is talking, then the other, addressed by the agent, and product. Product here, I think, it's not just product in this elevated sense of end of the production process. It's more product like remainder, like what remains, what falls out uh, even as undigested and so on. Then what Lacan does is turn, turn this around for one quarter. If the divided subject and here, ah, here comes the beauty of Lacanian hermeneutics. But I'm really so ashamed telling you this, because uh, first you will get this in the paper now, two hours from now, and so on. Uh, now this is a beautiful Lacanian theological dogmatic question. Divided subject. Ah, between what and what? Well, this is a big question. For Lacan, it's not simply conscious, unconscious. The only consequent answer is between something and nothing. The subject is divided between something, the signifier that represents him, and the void, nothing. And the object A is the metonymy of the void, however you put it. It fills in the void. Object A, as Lacan put it, is another of these false objects which just fill in the gap, which are just a positive form of the void. Okay. So what happens when that's the beauty, hysterical discourse? It's so clear. A divided subject confronts a figure of the master with a demand. The demand is what? I am some kind of object for others. Tell me, produce knowledge about what kind of an object I am. If you want, the most annoying form of this is you are in love and you address your master, the lady. No, usually uh, la ladies do this. You address the man. Tell me why you love me. Like, give me reasons. Of course, it's an absolutely impossible demand. 
Because the moment you give reasons, it's no longer love, you know. Love is never like, I love you because of your beautiful lips, smile, or whatever. Uh, so, uh, and, and again, knowledge is produced here, which is why Lacan even emphasizes that science, not as part of the university machinery, but creative science, inventions, are part of discourse of hysteria. And this is the original, for Lacan, position of the subject. You know, all that bullshit uh, of uh, uh, desire is an open desire, the question of desire, I never know what I want. That's not, for Lacan, the original enigma of desire. Here, Lacan doesn't refer to, but says something that was later well developed by one who was not his follower, although associated with him, Jean Laplanche, who developed in a wonderful way this logic of what he called enigmatic signifier. A small child, already very early, no notices that all people around him, parents, sisters, brothers, uncles, blah, blah, play some games with him. He or she is something for them. And he or she also notices that they themselves don't know what these games are. But uh, this is totally impenetrable for him. So this is the original hysterical question. Not what am I? No, sorry, precisely this. Not uh, what do I want? And it's always lack and I never get what I want. But what is it in me that others see in me? That's why, for example, the original hysterical question is, why, what am I for you? Or what's in my name? Like, uh, and this is why the proper hysterical reaction to every symbolic investiture is, okay, you proclaim me a professor, but am I really a professor? Do I deserve it? Am I, like, uh, what, you know, the hysterical question is what for an object I am for the other. This is why, as my friend Mladen Dolar developed years ago in one of the early classic texts entitled Beyond Interpolation, this is why uh, hysteria is Lacan's answer to Althusser implicitly. Uh, Louis Althusser, you know his theory of interpolation. Hey, you, you recognize yourself. Interpolation is simply the allocation of a certain symbolic identity conferred on you by society. We are all identified as something. Man, woman, professor, pupil, traitor. Now in, in Turkey there are many interpolations as traitor. <laughs> I love them in Turkey. Oh my God, now they fired 5,000 uh, professors. No? And, uh, it's, it's mad, actually. Okay, uh, no. <coughs> sorry. I have the honor of being personally attacked half a year ago by Erdogan, you know. He attacked uh, Chomsky, but then in one version he also mentioned me as the most corrupted, unworthy of. But I had to laugh so much because Erdogan, no, sorry, another pupil of Erdogan, his Goebbels, he has a guy who is uh, Turkish Goebbels. And he said that it's such a shame that Zizek, me, speaks in such a totally irrational way, totally in discordance with great European rationalists like Lacan who speak in such a clear way and so on. Ha <laughs> ha, I had to die laughing. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go on. So, uh, you got the point about uh, hysteria. Then, uh, the other turn around would have been, if you move in this direction, not sorry, this... Sorry. I don't understand how hysteria in relation to our souls alters our Althusser. Do? I don't understand how hysteria is an answer to Althusser. Ah, Could sorry, I'm sorry. That? I'm sorry. It's simply like this. Hysteria is the basic subversive reaction to ideological, uh, to interpolation. Interpolation means I recognize myself as something, whatever society claims that I am. And the basic hysterical reaction is, but why am I what you, the big other, claim that I am? Yeah. And that's, uh, this is how I even read one of my favorite, you know, I'm a kids guy, don't yes. kid me, I like pre raphaelites And you have that wonderful painting, no, I'm 
non-educated here. It's not Rossetti. Who painted the moment when Angel comes to Mary? Is it Hunt? I don't know. Sorry? I think it's Holman Hunt, isn't it? I yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I like is how furious she is, the horror. Basically, it's a hysterical reaction, wonderful, of a woman. Like, you are telling me that without fucking I will have to bear God. What the hell? Why did I deserve it? <laughs> like, she is furious at this interpolation. And even my friends told me that this is the nicest part of Jewish legacy. The idea of why didn't just God leave us alone, you know? Why we were, were we to be elected people and so on? It would have been so nice to remain there barbarians in the, in the desert and so on. And that's what Moses tells God when he calls him. It's right there. In the what does he say? He says, why me? I can't speak. My brother's a lawyer. Go talk to him. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. But you know what would be my ultimate idea? We don't have time to go into this now. My ultimate idea would have been to deal with Jesus Christ himself as a hysteric. Like, fuck you, I want to screw ladies in Samaria, why do I have to, to play this role? And I think that, although I don't like Scorsese, but that his, uh, what was his movie? The one? Of Christ. Yeah, yeah, it was almost all about this Christ's resistance. Fuck it, why should I be the son of God and so on, you know? And I, I think Mel Gibson's film. Sorry? Mel Gibson's film. Mel Gibson's film, I think, is an absolute, but not because, no, I almost, uh, in a way, I enjoyed it. You know why? For this obscenity of how uh, they talk Latin and whatever, <laughs> Aramaic. Aramaic is <laughs> wonderful kids. No, you know what's for me, I already developed this. Uh, uh, I will go on. Uh, uh, what's for me the ultimate bullshit of that film? And it brings us to all this topic of inconsistency. Where do we find this part uh, in the Bible? You know, the last words of Jesus, there are seven. And I think the way to read them is precisely not to ask which was the original true word of Christ or the other way around. Can we put them in a proper order? We should read them along the lines of what in quantum physics they, they call superposition. We don't have to choose. They are one above the other at the same level, not one after the other. And the two of the nastiest feelings, if I were to be a Christian and we were to be in medieval times, two people would be immediately burned in public, Mel Gibson and Franco Zeffirelli for his. <laughs> because what they try to do is something which is for me an undescribable obscenity. They try to arrange the seven words, last words of Christ into some kind of a logical order. You know, Christ says, I'm thirsty, this is one. Okay, he gets a drink, then he says, okay, now it's finished, I'm coming to you, my father, or whatever. It's an obscenity. So again, the point would have been to keep the inconsistency. Those movies are just uh, terrible. And you know, an interesting thing, sorry, I always talk too much, happened, I don't know how many years ago, 20, when we were celebrating the 100 years of invention of cinema, and Vatican did something quite interesting. They published a list of 100 best films of all time which was a pretty good list. For example, you know what they included in religious films? The only one there was Pasolini, Matthew. None of that, Zeffirelli. And Zeffirelli exploded and he uh, published a text in Italy claiming that it's clear now that Vatican is under communist control. You know? <laughs> no, because Zeffirelli was the member of the, uh, how do you call it, uh, the Italian neo-fascist party and so on is clear. But let me go on, sorry. Uh, sorry, you know, I go on. I'll go on with that. Uh, university. Yeah. University. Imagine it like this. We have this enigma of what remains. You are interpolated, but fuck it. I don't know what you are, all the mystery behind. Uh, in this sense, you can say that the subject is divided between this and this, between the signifier that stands for you and what is in you beneath it. So, university discourse addresses this surplus 
This is, I think, a wonderful reading of Michel Foucault, Discipline Control. A knowledge which addresses this excess which resists symbolization, and this is the educational point of university discourse, it tries to produce out of it a full subject. Ah, but here it's a beautiful example how the truth of the university discourse is nonetheless master. The way I read this is in a very simple way. Just look at all today's economists who explain things, you can this to that to the market, and they all desperately try to present it as neutral knowledge, you know. These are facts, sorry, you do this, that, but it's clear that there is a position of the master, a normative dimension beneath it. It's not never just neutral knowledge. This is a very nice insight here of Lacan, of how even the most neutral, pretending to be neutral, scientific approach always have, has a bias of a master, because this master, this signifier represents the subject. This is also the subjective aspect of it. And now I want to return to what Jacqueline said before about feminine, because I think this is now the true madness. I don't have time to develop it now, but I think that in some sense we can also sexualize the four discourses. That the axis of master and university is male, university universality, master exception, and here we get, uh, I agree with you Jacqueline, absolutely, a much more subtle distinction. They are not external to each one. It's just a subtle shift from, uh, from hysteria to, to analyst. In a way, if you bring your hysteria to the end, you become an analyst. That's why every good psychoanalyst will tell you, if you have non-hysterics, the big problem of psychoanalytic treatment, if you get a pervert, is to hystericize him first. Because hystericization is, in a way, a condition of analytic work. That's the problem with perverts. You know, I'm not sure here, maybe some of you got a better position, but, uh, 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 like, where would the discourse of, where would the discourse of, uh, the discourse of perversion fit here? I'm tempted to say, but I'm not sure that perversion has the structure of university discourse. Because the first distinction, as Lacan emphasizes, between hysteria, and hysteria also covers obsessional neurotic. I'm here like Lacan Orthodox Freudian. For Freud, uh, obsessional neurosis, compulsive neurosis, is a subspecies of hysteria. It's not a... Uh, but what they, although they ask a different question, they are both discourses of question. His, what defines hysteria Hysterical constellation is questioning. I am dead, but what am I dead? Questioning. Well, one big thing about a pervert is that he doesn't question, he knows. The pervert is the one who knows about the other. In this formal sense, I claim Stalinism was somehow a discourse of perversion. Not because Stalinists were doing horrible things, but you know, the basic obscenity of Stalinism is not to tell you, I don't care what you think, you have to follow the party, but to tell you, party knows better than you what you really want, or what is really good for you, and so on. I think that's exactly right. That's why Freud says you have a splitting of the ego in the pervert. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly yeah, I mean, this yeah, is... So I yeah, the, pro the yeah, product yeah, of yeah, perversion yeah. is the split this ego. This is just, just orthodox yeah. Freudian treatment of perversion. And that S1 is the maternal phallus. Uh, here I am, um, I, I don't know. My mother didn't have a phallus, so I don't know how... I'm just talking about... I know, sorry, I know. <laughs> Where do you have maternal phallus? Here. Right, yeah. That, that, that's the basis of his claim to total knowledge. Uh, yes, or, 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 although you know, so I prefer I prefer to abstain from 
giving the final opinion here because uh, all I'm ready to say, I don't know enough about that, is that what fascinates me now, and the French guy, you know, Miller paid for his treason. How? He's by far no longer the best interpreter of Lacan in French. You have now in the last decade at least two guys, uh, François Balmès, who unfortunately died of cancer, I don't know what, and Guy Le Goffet, L-E and then G-O-U-F-E-Y. Guy Le Goffet, and now finally we succeeded to translate, he wrote the best reading that I know of Lacan's formula of situation. It will be translated for, I think, Northwestern University Press now. And what I want to say is that Goffet has wonderful insights on what does Freud mean by potence and impotence and omnipotence and so on. And in a wonderful reading, he claims that uh, the strict psychoanalytic notion of impotence, this apparently impotent mother or whoever, that impotence, sorry, omnipotence is always an effect of impotence. That, like, uh, you almost have it here, again, the omnipotent other is a mask of the other's impotence. Like, the clearest example would have been in religion. The predestination God, omnipotent, no? is a mask of the fact that God is an idiot who can't even decide and screws it up with predestination and so on and so on and so on. So again, omnipotence, I think it's an extremely interesting uh, uh, category. But you know what? Where are we now? Yes, okay. We are at the end. And I hate you. Sorry, for... Uh, we will go tomorrow on, but... Which way? The analyst. The but analyst. I began with the analyst. I didn't. Yeah. The analyst here. This is now. I thought it's clear, relatively simple. It's simply that uh, you are in analysis, and the analyst should never play the normative role of I know better what you. The knowledge is just the presupposed knowledge in transference, but the analyst has to provoke you. Through he is non-commitment, frustration, and so on, to produce a signifier which of the in your signifier of inconsistency. Maybe I will try to develop this tomorrow. Maybe a good example of this signifier would have been as if a good punchline in a joke. You know, like, like uh, all. And here I have a, the nastiest example how Lacan was imperfect. In his seminar for uh, the, the, the something on the unconscious, formations of the unconscious, it's so crazy how Lacan himself is sometimes the worst anti-Lacanian. He quotes that perfect joke and misses the Lacanian point, the punchline. The joke is, you know, about this East European how do you call it, matchmaker, who tries to sell the woman to the potential guy, bride, no? And, you know, the joke is that for every negative feature, he finds a good reason, no? Like, the bride complains, but she is ugly. The guy says, okay, so you, you will not have to worry that she will... Uh, that she will uh, deceive you, you know, nobody will, will want to, and so on through all, the guy says, but she even cannot read, the, uh, the guy says, okay, you don't, will not have to worry that she will talk back to you, she will just in silence, so all, all this, and Lacan then says, it's incredible, he says, and so on indefinitely, no, it's not and so on indefinitely, it's a wonderful, precisely the new S1 reversal. Well, at the end, the, the bride-to-be produces a feature which you cannot in any way present as a good reason. And you know what? The, you must know what the guy, the, how do you call it, matchmaker asks. But what do you want her to be perfect or whatever, you know? <laughs> After all, I think that, you, you see, something like this, this is how I read uh, S1 producing analyst discourse. It's just a signifier which prevents you from continuing with the perverse game of endless repetition, whatever, and so on and so on. So again, uh, 
here is what I propose now, because there are so many other things to do, as always. Uh, I, uh, Jacqueline, I read your text, thanks very much on that. And you know what I want to refer to tomorrow? You have towards the end, because I cheat, I always look at the end, at the punchline. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Usually people complain, even in restaurants, that I speak too loud, so I'm not used to this. Uh, you remember towards the end of your text on, uh, on uh, trans, remember, you mentioned this option of maybe sexual difference itself will disappear and blah blah. Well, I want to go into that. Is this a real prospect of brain sciences, blah, blah, because I want to, so much new age or technological nonsense is written there, you know. That, but I think there is something real going on there. We cannot just dismiss it, dismiss it, and I would like to go also a little bit into that tomorrow. But I will go on with four discourses, and I hate you, you know why? Because I have to break my word and really say something a little bit about four discourses. But the big thing remains, where do I see capitalism? But again, that's the deal I'm making with you. Now, literally now, in half an hour, you will get 35 dense pages of the text, where I explain all this and capitalism. And what I propose, so that tomorrow is the last day that, I don't, <coughs> that we don't lose time, we can maybe even begin by some of you attacking me, reacting to that. And you know me enough to know that whatever you say, I will find a way in replying to you to talk about whatever I want, you know. <laughs> so don't worry about that, you know. So, but, but what do you think, Jacqueline? You know what's my problem here? I don't totally subscribe this for discourses. Like, I have these problems. Is this a non-historical, like, eternal formula, I am more tempted to read it in a historical way, that Lacan is simply putting into a formula a certain modern dynamic of disintegration of the classical master and then where this can lead us. A strictly something historically limited, you know? Lacan is here for me caught in the same problem as, for me at least, either Judith Butler or Ernesto Laclau. Look, if you look, I asked this Judith once, her theory of this, all this, you know, uh, gender trouble, performative construction of... I asked her a simple question. Is this simply a trans-historical theory so that already a primitive Neanderthal half-ape man were discursively constructing their identity, or is this a specifically specific theory of our post-traditional era? Now, what I prohibited her is to say that it's both at the same time in this pseudo-Hegelian way that something which is eternally true only becomes visible as such today. And sorry, before I give you the word, I have the same problem with Ernesto's hegemony idea. Is it that already uh, Neanderthalians were fighting for hegemony? Or, because on the other hand, Ernesto's theory of hegemony is so clearly historically conditioned. It, so, how to bring these two together? Strike back. I will simply say that this was Yeah. My yeah. So I that's was. What I think yeah. Lacan is talking about, and that's the moment that conditions his theory. But Lacan is here cheating. You know, in what sense? I will tell you. He is too general. Sometimes, for example, I know he says about Soviet Union that if there ever was a university discourse in power, it's Soviet Union and so on. But at the same time, he claims modernity as such, sometimes he claims capitalism is universal. He, he cheats there and maybe, maybe it's simply something quite sinful for Lacanians to say, that maybe this theory is simply not strong enough to catch the historical specificity. I mean, you know what's my position here? I'm a good Christian, but in a Marxist sense. But this I mean, I am for trans-historic universality, but every trans-historic universality has to be historically specified. No, this absolute Marx knew this and so on. Okay, 
Tomorrow we go on. Today, pray for me that I will survive it. I have to go. I couldn't say no to the theater. Can you imagine me in a theater <laughs> sit, sitting for three hours to see, to see Richard III? I already did my duty. I saw on Wikipedia the narrative so that if I fall asleep, I will not miss anything. But I have to do it because Sophie hinted gently that Rafe wants me there and so on. And I already said in advance that I will be very tired afterwards. Because admit it, even if you are against death penalty, there is one situation where death penalty is justified. If I meet Rafe Weiss after the scene and he looks at me innocently and says, Slavoj, I don't care what you say, even if you were disgusted, this is pure lie, but just tell me please what was your impression, you know, and then this expecting grace, you know, the, the big thing that I will say or whatever, you know. I try to play this game as far as possible. I try to redeem his Rafe Coriolanus, with a totally crazy reading that Coriolanus is a true working class hero and so on. I didn't believe in my theory. But with Richard III, you know what's my problem immediately with Richard III? I'm maybe here reactionary. I'm for him. I'm against Tudors. I think he was the last good king. I read history books, laws that he enforced. They were pretty progressive. He was the first king to explicitly tried to push legal equality of common people. He was absolutely not this type of... And on the other hand, I didn't, if there were arch-Stalinists, these were the early Tudors, and they were rewriting history like crazy to justify their claim. Sorry. The internet was interesting. Sorry? The internet was interesting. Well, sorry, my? If we ask you whether you like it, you can tell him it was interesting. I will, because I think he's not in this academic, uh, in this academic stuff, so he will, ah, nice, I'm glad that you say this, lovely. But you know what, for a brief second, because I'm afraid of women with glasses like you, I thought that you wanted to say that my comment on race and so on was interesting. So. <laughs> because, you know, that's my idea of women, don't take it personally, women with glasses. They can be strict and so on, now comes the politically incorrect part. But, you know, when a woman with glasses takes off the glasses, it means now you can do whatever you want, you know. I'd rather stop before you arrest me. <laughs> Thanks very much. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Is Madison still here? No. Okay, but maybe she already sent it to you, no? She promised me again that no, she will... Sorry? Oh my God, I hate you, these efficient digital girls who know everything. Sorry? Will you do the Catholic School tomorrow? Can we start with that? Yeah, okay, no problem. Yeah, you can yes. say Yes, uh, two. Peter McClure is part of the country. Two? He's great. He's great that he did it. Thank you.